I'm not sure how to begin these hello, I guess. Um, uh, before we really start, I just wanted you to speak a few words about uh, what your life was before you started writing books. I heard you were uh, doing something with the United Nations. Uh, could you tell us a bit about that, your life before um, full-time writing? Yeah. Um, I was always writing, but coming from a small country, as I'm sure the Hungarian writers will know, it's very difficult to make a living off of writing. So. I thought I better have a solid education, and also in Denmark, I come from an immigrant family, uh, you know, where my parents don't have education. So my mother came as a war child from Austria, and so it's even more important, I thought, to be independent. So I studied macroeconomics, and after finishing studying, um, I got a job here with the United Nations, first in Tanzania for two years, um, where I was an economist with the office and got seconded to the government, so I was advising on macroeconomic policy. And then later, yeah, I went to New York and had a job there as the right hand for the head of UNDP, so that was a lot of speech writing, very political work. And then I went to Mozambique um, in 93-94, also for two years, where I worked for um, the peace process. You know, there had been 17 years civil war, really horrendous war in Mozambique, and there was a ceasefire and we came in to implement the whole peace uh, mm -hmm. agreement. And then after that, I had paid out my student debts and <laughs> saved up a little money. Um, so I left, Mozambique was my last job with the UN, and I just went back and um, to Denmark, had a little studio, <laughs> and wrote my first book there, which took four years. Um, and sometimes I did short-term consultancies, you know, just to make a living. And mm -hmm. I think after my second book, uh, I mean, I was lucky enough they went, you know, well enough that basically I think since then I've lived off of the writing. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes, well, sometimes you don't know if you can pay rent in three months, but that's how it is as an artist. Has it ever happened? Um. Um, well, no, sometimes I've had to live on credit cards and loans, uh, but uh, I think generally, yeah, ever since nothing became famous, I have been fine, it, you know. Iskolába járunk. Tanulunk! Álmodozunk, hogy hasznos felnőttek legyünk! De felnőttnek lenni semmi más nem jelent, mint hogy rájövünk, hogy valójában nem tudunk semmit. Feladjuk az álmainkat, és közben egész életünkben úgy teszünk, mint hogyha nagyon fontosak lennék. Egy nagy színjáték az egész. I know maybe most people don't see it like that, but I do. Because it's not totally realistic, uh, yes, even though it's in a real world. But if one really looks also at the language, it's not how any young person speaks, nor is it how any grown-up would speak. It's somehow an invented language, and that gives it that fairy tale feel. Um, and, it, yeah, it is not written as, okay, I shall tell as a grown-up young people how to think about the meaning of life, because of the thing is, as grown-ups, we don't have the answers either. But only by asking the questions, you get a little bit closer to the answer for yourself. What happened to myself over time with that book is, I became much happier for life. Because even though the book yeah, doesn't give clear answers to anything, the children towards the end, they do find something that has a meaning, and they find it you know, because they get confronted with death, yes. and you realize you'd rather be alive than, than dead, then there must be some mm. meaning to life. Uh, and it's also about, I thought, Pierre Anton is right with what he says in logical terms. The Earth is 4.6 billion years old, and you live maximum maybe 100 years. So we are really small ants in that comparison. Is it worth the bother? But the thing is, he has withdrawn from life when he sits up in the tree, which is like also a metaphor for how he looks at life. He looks at everything in the large perspective, and there he's right. But we don't live in the large perspective. We live in this small here and now. And in the near perspective, everything has meaning. It has meaning to sit here and talk, to taste the tea, or smell the lemon, or walk in the forest. Or even when you're sad, it's it's quite extraordinary that we can feel sad, actually, and you can bend and stretch your fingers. And uh, So to me, what happened after I wrote the book was somehow I became friends with Pianton in my head, as I think everybody has their own Pianton, and sometimes 
they don't hear him, they are very busy, or they pushed him aside, but other periods he speaks loudly and questions what we think has meaning. And to me now, where I used to be scared when I thought of these questions I couldn't answer, it was like, okay, suddenly all the windows were open and there's light there. And when I hear my Pierre Anton's voice, it's more like he reminds me how fantastic life is and that I have to appreciate every second. That, yes, I don't know why I'm here or have a life, if there is a God or not, I can only believe. But eventually I know I'm here. I know I have that gift of life. And maybe life is even so much more fantastic and amazing that we got this gift we don't know who gave us. And therefore we have to appreciate it, every second of it. Um, when I write, I'm all the different characters. So my feeling is, okay, what would Agnes do here? What would Pierre Anton do? What would Sophie do? But also the smaller characters, little Ingrid, uh, even the dog, <laughs> you know. So, and then it adds up to something. And the way I've seen this book always is first and foremost as a story. And, and then that story somehow happens to do something to our heads, also to my head. <laughs> so, um, so I can still have discussion with readers where people raise questions or comment on something that I have never thought about before. I mean, and that's 20 years later, and I really discussed this book a lot with many people. And I don't know, it's somehow its own, that book. <laughs> so. Yeah, it had its own life. Um, it's, uh, it's interesting to me how you pick your narrators um, for, for certain books. I've read uh, Mochka Kurum. I'm not sure what it's yes, titled in English. But, yeah. And, and it's a very different feeling and it's a very different mood uh, yeah. from, what, uh, from what nothing uh, was and what nothing is. And uh, I, I just wonder how, how you pick these uh, narrators that have not much of a personal connection to you necessarily, and not, not much that we can see, uh, but still you tell these stories from their perspectives. Um, yeah. Let me think. It's a lot about that I invent all my characters. I don't do autofiction that some writers do or write very close to themselves. I don't. I write about what I'm preoccupied with. So the theme is, is really what is on my mind or my heart. And in Matchka Kuram, I wanted to write about what happens when love goes wrong and, or when relations go wrong and relations between two people or relations between groups of people, as between countries, or geopolitically, or ethnically. Uh, um, and I had been working, um, as I said, in Mozambique at the end of the Civil War, and I'd seen so much brutality, and I just knew I had to write about war. But I somehow couldn't write about what I'd seen. So, um, because the Yugoslav War, or the falling apart of the Yugoslavia, was the same period of time in the early 90s, and I had been following it very closely also because my mo mother is from southern Austria, just from the border to Slovenia. So again, I feel very connected to the Balkans. Um, and my fa mother's family name, it is from Slovenia. It's, uh, uh, so it felt very natural to, to go there and figure out what really you know, happened. How could people who have been neighbors or gone to school together start slaughtering each other? Um, and I also felt Yugoslavia is the shame of my generation. You know, we weren't born when there was the Second World War, but we let a genocide take place in the middle of Europe in the 90s, in, you know, in my lifetime. And I wanted to look at that. But the actual, the core of the, uh, you can say the narration, is about this man, this uh, war surgeon, Caribbean, um, who he yeah, sets out to kill his own emotions for this woman he can't get because she's married to someone else and she won't leave her husband. And actually I had tried to write that book from a woman's point of view initially, but it became always like sentimental. And just, I was actually in Bosnia, in Mostar, and I just finished Semi and sent off my last edits on it. And I still remember now thinking, you know, I'll have a holiday. I was visiting a friend. And I went down, you know, the restaurants down towards the river, even at that time when everything was still destroyed, but there were you know, a few restaurants that had opened. Of course. And I sat there, and suddenly I had this voice that is the beginning of Machka Kurum. And I knew that was the voice I had to write it in. Mm -hmm. 
And of course, also I know, having lived all around the world and worked in the United Nations, many cultures I know as much as I know the Danish culture. So, and it's my adult universe. Uh, and for years I had a Jamaican boyfriend. I, I would not have dared to write about um, a Jamaican person if I, if I didn't know that very intimately. But it's not him at all. It's a totally invented character I write about, but I know the culture. Um, and this, this for me is always, I have to, to know all, a lot of dimension of what I write about, or, or I can't take that. But, but within the, what I know, I can invent a lot, I feel. Idegen szívű pogány észteknek egyetlen épcsontja sem! Mert nem volt többé kegyelem! Uh, your personal choices are, are responsibilities in the sense that, um, like about, let's say, climate change, uh, are my actions as a person important or is is it more of a collective responsibility that everyone we have to decide that we have to get better and and we have systematic change do we need both do we need just one what do you feel about this i think we need both i don't think even if all of us try to take the best possible decisions for climate uh, i don't think it would be enough to change it because what has to happen is that the whole energy infrastructure has to be changed, so the reliance yeah, on oil and fossil fuels have to be changed, and these are government decisions. Um, and it's possible today, I was speaking with a Danish architect just recently, who is building a whole little village in Denmark, where all energy is either sun or thermal heating from the earth. And there's even, they create so much electricity there that the company providing the sensei, they will give free energy to anybody who lives in this village if they just get the surplus of what is produced. That's how easy it is, you know, and we're not that strong a country. <laughs> so, so this that when that can be done, it could be done anywhere with, if it's just, you know, new buildings being built like that. And I'm also told, you know, if you can put solar panels in the roads, imagine you put this in, in the highways, we would need no more oil and gas and uh, fossil fuels. So, but, but the, you know, the big decisions on that has to come from governments. But we can influence governments because it's about who we choose to sit there. So it's really important to use your vote. A lot of people feel, oh, I'm just one, you know, there are millions who shall vote. But no, it's if each one of us go and vote, for what we, we think are the ones who take, you know, the climate problem seriously, we will change this. But of course, onto that, we can do also some things ourselves. And I think a lot of people are already doing it. Um, I know a lot of young people who are vegetarian or, um, or vegan. I definitely have, you know, I don't eat much meat myself. I do eat a little bit because I can't have gluten, so otherwise there's hardly anything I can eat. I fly still because of my work quite a bit, but I don't have a car. I, you know, so one can make up in different ways, and I think it's important that we don't become you know, religious on other people's behalf, but it's more about encouragement and say, hey, if we all do a little bit, we can really 
avoiding move complacency. Yeah. yeah. Um, and if we just, instead of having meat, as most do in America, twice a day, just would have once a day. Already that is a lot. So, so we can make a change, each one of us. But the other thing I think is very important is we have too many people on this earth. If we want to keep the planet livable over long term, we have to become fewer people. And um, so I think it's an important choice, and that's of course an individual choice, not to have too many kids. Um, mm -hmm. Because this of course must be done over time, I'm in no favor of ever <laughs> uh, cutting <laughs> down on numbers of people elsewhere or sending them to Mars or something. But we can have fewer children. And there are so many children anyway who are orphans or who need better lives that one can take care of if you, you, you know, want to be close with children. But it's again something we can as individuals look, look at. But also government, instead of what they're doing now, giving incentive to have more kids, they can do the opposite and give incentives to have fewer kids. Um, I don't again believe in forcing uh, the model of one child, but one can give encouragement for one child. I'm asking because uh, a lot of your uh, literature and a lot of your works uh, talk about this uh, responsibility uh, in different ways. Like, just to bring it back a little bit to Shemmi, uh, it has this idea of all the tragedies that have gone down by the end. Mm. It wasn't any one person's fault, was it? It was a, it was a collective, not, real, not really a decision, but just... The, the happenings, the events that took place, they kind of forced each other into it. So it's, uh, I'm just curious about what you think uh, um, are the right decisions in this situation. And if someone, let's say, asked uh, one of the characters from Shemmy, do you think this was your fault? Uh, uh, would they be right in answering no? Just like uh, um, your thoughts on these issues. I think they, they would all answer no, that it was not their fault. It was Pianton's fault, or at least for a while they, they want to believe that. But they're also all at fault. Um, they could each have stopped it at some point and said, no, we're not going down this road or I'm not going with the rest of the group. And I think that would have changed the dynamic, if, even if just one person stepped out. Um, but yeah, it always interests me a lot to write about things going wrong, um, not as any kind of prediction. I certainly never hope any of the things that happen in some of my books would happen. But I think when we imagine this would go wrong, we also can see the mechanisms of maybe how we would stop it. And the mechanism in semi, it's a lot, the children become fanatics. It's a gradual process. It's very positive in a way that they set out to look for the meaning of life. When they don't feel the adult world around them, give them any answers. It's all about just competition, making money, nothing you can feel that makes sense. So that's positive to say, we look for the meaning of life. But it's the moment that that project becomes more important than respecting the feelings of themselves and each other, that we are to going towards extremism. And this is where, once they are far enough down that road, it's very difficult for them to turn around, because a lot have already sacrificed so much for this that they don't want it questioned. Um, and, and that project yeah, becomes more important than any one of them. But yeah, they could have stopped it if, all of them could have stopped it if they had just left it, told their parents, um, gone with their best friend and say, we don't want to be part of this anymore. Ivan, Shelby. Pontos neked ez a szandál, Agnes? Mi? Ja, ja, ja nem. Nem, nem. Annyira azért nyilván nem pontos. Akkor akár be is adhatod. Pláne, hogy nem is márkás. Ja. De, de pont most beszéltük meg, hogy valami olyat kell beadni, ami tényleg számít, és ez csak egy szandál. Agnes, mindketten tudjuk, hogy ez egy elég fontos szandál. Három hónapig könyörögtél érte anyukádnak. You mentioned uh, that positive aspect of trying to find uh, meaning in life. Uh, I wanted to ask you about um, how you feel your works uh, present uh, positivity and negativity. Do you, do you think that the way you write is, uh, is overly pessimistic at some point? Or, or do you feel that uh, the things that you say are just reality and you have to write them that way? How do you, how do you think about this? Um, I don't think that when I write it's that conscious. 
it's just like some there's a voice in my head and I have to write what it's saying and see where it goes. Um, but yeah, I do write about often quite tough subjects, yes, yeah, war, as killing, as fanaticism, and but as I think is evident from my essays and what I also do, a lot of activism, in a way I'm an, I'm an optimistic and hopeful kind of person. I, I need to see the hope in anything, otherwise I don't find it worth doing. It's like then we can all go and die if we don't think there could be a better path. And I don't think I write books without hope, even semi that has an unhappy ending. It has that for the characters, but not for the reader. Um, there's not a lot of light, but there is a, a sliver of light in this thing that, okay, there is a meaning, but you, you have to look for it yourself. And you're also about, you have to respect the meaning. Because the children, by giving up whatever mattered to them, they also lost that meaning. Um, and I think the reader very much feels that, even if they can't put it in words when they close the book. But they, they get this. Um, and you may come back to them later. And so I think there is a lot of positive elements or hope as like going on in my books, even when they describe something horrible. Yeah, I think very often what I try, and even if it's very subtle in my books, is to find better roads um, through some of yeah, the problems that we are facing, either existentially or in, in real life. or match Kermit's in, in war situations. Um, the way you talk about writing your books, it seems to me like it's a very, uh, a very personal and very out-of-body like process. Have you ever read a book of yours and were surprised by anything in it? Has it ever happened? Like, um, Yes, I mean in Sydney I'm surprised by the violence. I'm really not someone who likes violence. I don't ever read thrillers. I don't see thrillers. I don't even see crime shows generally on TV because I, I have to go out of the room when it gets bad or close my eyes, even some really ridiculous, silly crime shows. And so anybody who knows me knows I don't like violence. And um, it was just that that book, once I had started it, I couldn't stop. I didn't want, and I'm not mentioning now what these violent events are because people should read for themselves. But I just couldn't stop it. Then it would have been a pedagogical kind of thing to the it was like the dynamic was there, okay, they start collecting small items that are not very important, the football, the favorite parrot earrings, um, the sandals. And then it grows, you know, with the hamster and so on. It's uh and there just was no way for me to stop. And I even tried to rewrite the end of that book several times because I didn't want the death that occurs to happen. But I couldn't get it to function without that. And it, then it took me years to figure out why. But it just, for me, it's very much a feeling. Um, how can I say? It's like when you listen to music, I think even those of us who can't write music or whatever, but we can almost hear when we listen to a melody, what is the right next note? And that's how I feel when I write. There's the right next note, and I can't explain it, but that's just how it is. And yeah, then I learn from my books myself. Or maybe I should say a short thing about how um, the short story collection Minden connects to Semi. Yeah, maybe we can uh, talk about it. I actually have that one uh, here with me. I tried to bring Mocha Kurama as well because I wanted to reread parts yeah. of it that I couldn't find at home. But, but yeah, yes, uh, that, that has a lot of, a lot of interesting uh, uh, ideas presented again, but in, like, yeah, in more condensed forms and more, more direct ways. So yeah. what, how does it connect? Um, it, it's not, of course, in any way a direct continuation of, of Semi or it's all different characters. But just because semi is somehow about what happens if you you don't think life has a meaning, if you, and minnan is about what connects us to life, that sense of belonging that is necessary for us to to feel at home and good in life, uh, and each story is somehow about 
what happens when you lose that sense of belonging. And different people, some are grown up, some are young people, but that's somehow what make you think that it's okay to be here falls apart. Uh, and that uh, fuels the action. And when there's a tiny thing like the girl in the Turkish uh, carpet who somehow loses the moral belief in her father, or it's uh, the bigger things. Um, somebody was just yeah, basically kills someone else and tries to justify it. Uh, so, yeah, often and also these stories have a, like a violent element, even though they're not about the violence. But it's, it's kind of strange how how you don't like violence and you're you're uh, um, not not a fan <laughs> of the concept yeah. of violence, and yet basically anything you write uh, ends up somehow connected to it. Do, do you think this is a this is not intentional, but but is this an inevitability? Do you think that the, the, it just exactly because you don't like it, it ends up in your work? I actually think so. I haven't thought so much about it before, but but I think there is something about that because probably at a very deep level, I'm really preoccupied about how do we avoid violence, and again to see how we can, shall avoid something. I think you have to imagine if it happens. Because then you can look at how did, how did we get there, and at which point could you have stopped it. Like in the story is the yellow light, with a boy who wants to take care of, of his younger siblings and protect them when he finds out the father has gone astray. And, but he ends up in Mexico in a situation where he evidently puts his siblings at risk, but he does it, you know, all the good intentions to save them, and from what he knows, that's the road he takes. But if he had just spoken to some teachers, it wouldn't have been necessary. If there had been someone in his life he could rely on, you know, or some grown-up who had seen this child is under a lot of stress that they can't manage on their own, it also wouldn't have happened. So, so for me, yeah, I think it's it's my way of trying to figure out how I can avoid what I hate, which is the violence here. Yeah. Do you have a favorite book, or maybe not even just book, but uh, uh, like uh, anything that's literary that you, you hold as maybe the best that you've ever read? That I read? Yes, no, yes, yes. Uh, I'll not say that there are two. I, I have like two literary heroes. The one is Knut Hamsen, the Norwegian writer. I think even if he went wrong politically with his opinions later in life, uh, his books are amazing, uh, very beautiful, often very brief, very poetic, but very deep. And the other one is Albert Camus, who in a more philosophical way, but could do the same. But in a very simple way, he writes uh, stories with enormous depth. And actually one of my books um, is somehow responding to, he puts forward in his book, The Fall, the thought that we are all morally fallen. Uh, it's about a lawyer who has suddenly realized that everything good he does, and this is a lawyer who takes on a lot of, you know, pro bono cases for poor people who can't afford to pay, so he helps them, he helps the blind woman across the street. But then at some point he just realizes he does all that only so that other people can see that he's a good person. And then the question, of course, comes, is he then really a good person? And, and this comes about because one evening when he sees a young woman drowning in the sand, he doesn't help her because there's nobody around. And that changes his life. And I always thought, it's such a brilliant book, and I agree that we are all morally fallen. But my question then was, can we decide how morally fallen we will be? And how do we do it in a modern competition-driven world where ethics is a bit like stone in the shoes? If you try to be nice with your colleagues and inform everybody, somebody else will overtake you and cheat you or steal your money or whatever. And so it's somehow the question, you know, through a story that I tried to raise uh, in a book called Cop. Uh, 
so so yeah that's always present in my mind 